Thomas King's lectures are titled, The Truth About Stories. And tonight's lecture is called, You'll Never Believe What Happened is Always a Good Way to Start. The stories, stories are a wondrous thing, and they're dangerous. The native novelist Leslie Silko in her book Ceremony tells how evil came into the world. It was witch people, not, not whites or Indians or blacks or Asians or Hispanics, witch people. Witch people from all over the world, way back when, they all came together for a witches' conference in a cave, having a good time, a contest actually, to see who could come up with the scariest thing. Some of them brewed up potions in pots. Some of them jumped in and out of animal skins. Some of them thought up charms and spells. It must have been fun to watch. Until finally, finally, there was only one witch left who hadn't done anything. No one knew where this witch came from, or this, if, if this witch was male or female, and all this witch had was a story. Unfortunately, the story that this witch told was an awful thing, full of fear and slaughter, disease and blood a story of murderous mischief. And when the telling was done, the other witches quickly agreed that this witch had won the prize. Okay, you win, they said. But what you said just now, it isn't so funny. It doesn't sound so good. We're doing okay without it. We can get along without that kind of thing. Take it back. Call that story back. But of course, it was too late. For once a story is told, it cannot be called back. Once told, it's loose in the world. So you have to be careful with the stories you tell, and you have to watch out for the stories you are told. But if I ever get to Pluto, that's how I'd like to begin, <laughs> with a story. Maybe I'd tell the inhabitants of Pluto one of the stories that I know. Maybe they'd tell me one of theirs. It wouldn't matter who went first. But which story? That's the real question. Personally, I'd like to hear a creation story, a story that recounts how the world was formed, how things came to be, for contained within creation stories are relationships that help to define the nature of the universe and how cultures understand the world in which they exist. And, as luck would have it, I happen to know a few. But I have a favorite. It's about a woman who fell from the sky, and it goes like this. Back at the beginning of imagination, the world we know as the Earth was nothing but water while above the world, someplace in space, was a much larger, more ancient world. And on that world was a woman, a crazy woman. Well, she wasn't exactly crazy. She was more nosy, curious, the kind of curious that doesn't give up, the kind that follows you around. Now, we all know that being curious is, is healthy, but being curious can get you into trouble. Don't be too curious, the birds told her. Okay, she said, I won't. But you know what? That's right. She kept on being curious. One day she was bathing in the river and she happened to look at her feet and discovered that she had five toes on each foot. One big toe and four smaller ones. They'd been there all along, of course, but now that the woman noticed them for the first time, she wondered why she had five toes instead of three or eight. And she wondered if more toes were better than fewer toes. So she asked her toes, hey, she said, how come there are only five of you? You're being curious again, said the toes. Another day, the woman was walking through the forest and found a moose relaxing in the shade by a lake. Hello, said the moose. Aren't you that nosy woman? <laughs> yes, I am, said the woman, and what I want to know is why you are so much larger than me. That's easy, said the moose, and he walked into the lake and disappeared. Don't you love cryptic stories? <laughs> I certainly do. Now, before we go any further, we should give this woman a name so we don't have to keep calling her the woman. How about Blanche? <laughs> Catherine? Thelma? Okay, look, I know expressing an opinion can be embarrassing, so let's do it the way we always do it, and let someone else make the decision for us. Someone we trust. Someone who will, oh, I don't know, promise to lower taxes. <laughs> someone like me. I say we call her Charm. Don't worry, we can change it later on if we want to. So one day, the woman we've decided to call Charm went looking for something good to eat. She looked at the fish, but she was not in the mood for fish. She looked at the rabbit, but she didn't feel like eating rabbit either. I've got this craving, said Charm. What kind of craving, said Fish? I want something to eat, but I don't know what it is. Maybe you're pregnant, said Rabbit. Whenever I get pregnant, I get cravings. <laughs> hmm, said Charm, maybe I am. And you know what? 
She was. What you need, Fish and Rabbit told Charm, is some red fern foot. Yes, said Charm, that sounds delicious. What is it? It's a root, said Fish, and it only grows under the oldest trees. It's the perfect thing for pregnant humans. Now, you're probably thinking that this is getting pretty silly, what with chatty fish and friendly rabbits, with moose disappearing into lakes and, God help us, talking toes. And you're probably wondering how in the world I expect you to believe any of this, given the fact that we live in a predominantly scientific, capitalistic, Judeo-Christian world governed by physical laws, economic imperatives, and spiritual precepts. <laughs> is that what you're thinking? <laughs> it's okay, you won't hurt my feelings. So Charm went looking for some red fern foot. She dug around this tree and she dug around that tree, but she couldn't find any. Finally, she came to the oldest tree in the forest and she began digging around its base. By now she was very hungry and very keen on some red fern foot, so she really got into the digging. And before long, she had dug a rather deep hole. Don't dig too deep, Badger told her. Mind your own business, Charm told him. Okay, said Badger, but don't blame me if you make a mistake. Now, you can probably guess what happened, right? Yeah, Charm dug right through to the other side of the world. That's curious, said Charm, and she stuck her head into that hole so she could get a better view. That's very curious, she said again, and she stuck her head further into the hole. Now, sometimes when I tell this story to children, I slow it down, and I have Charm stick her head into that hole by degrees. But most of you are adults and have already figured out that Charm is going to stick her head into that hole so far that she's either going to get stuck or she's going to fall through. And sure enough, she fell through, right through the hole and into the sky. Uh-oh, Charm thought to herself, that wasn't too smart. But she couldn't do much about it now, and as she began to tumble through the sky, began to fall and fall and fall and fall, spinning and turning, floating through the vast expanse of space, and off in the distance, just on the edge of sight, was a small blue dot floating in the heavens. And as Charm tumbled down through the black sky, the dot got bigger and bigger. You've probably figured this part out, too, but just so there's no question, this blue dot is the Earth. Well, well, sort of. It's the Earth when it was young, when there was nothing but water, when it was simply a water world. And Charm was headed right for it. Now, in the meantime, on this water world on Earth, a bunch of water animals are swimming around and floating around and diving and talking about how much fun water is. Water, 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 said the ducks. There's nothing like water. <laughs> yes, said the muskrats. We certainly like being wet. <laughs> it's even better if you're underwater, said the sunfish. Oh, try jumping into it, said the dolphins. And just as the dolphins said this, they looked up into the sky. Uh-oh, said the dolphins. And everyone looked up in time to see Charm falling towards them. And as she came around the moon, the water animals were suddenly faced with four variables. Mass, velocity, compression, and displacement. <laughs> and with two problems. The ducks who have great eyesight could see that Charm weighed in at about 150 pounds. And the beaver who have a head for physics and math knew that she was coming in fast accelerating at, oh, 32 feet per second per second to be precise, give or take a little for drag and atmospheric friction. <laughs> and the whales knew from many years of study that water does not compress, while the dolphins could tell anyone who asked that while it won't compress, water will displace, which brought the animals to the first of the two problems. If charm hit the water at full speed, it was going to create one very large tidal wave and ruin everyone's day. So quick as they could, all the water birds flew up and formed a net with their bodies. And as Charm came streaking down, the birds caught her, broke her fall, brought her gently to the surface of the water, just in time to deal with the second of the two problems. Where to put her? They could just dump her in the water, but it didn't take a pelican to see that Charm was not a water creature. <laughs> Can you swim, asked the sharks. Not very well, said Charm. How about holding your breath for a long time, asked the seahorses. Maybe for a minute or two, said Charm. Floating, said the seals. Can you float? I don't know, said Charm. I've never really tried floating. So what are we going to do with you, said the lobsters. Hurry up, said the birds, flapping their wings as hard as they could. Hurry up. Perhaps you could put me on something large and flat, Charm told the water animals. 
Well, as it turned out, the only place in this water world that was large and flat was the back of the turtle. Oh, okay, said Turtle. But if anyone else falls out of the sky, she's on her own. <laughs> so the water animals put charm on the back of the turtle and everyone was happy, well, at least for the next month or so, until the animals noticed that charm was going to have a baby. It's going to get a little crowded, said the muskrats. What are we going to do, said the geese. It wouldn't be so crowded, Charm told the water animals, if we had some dry land. Sure, agreed the water animals, even though they had no idea what dry land was. Charm looked over the side of the turtle down into the water, and she turned to the water animals. Who's the best diver, she asked. A contest, screamed the ducks. All right, shouted the muskrats. What do we have to do, asked the eels. Well, it's easy, said Charm. One of you has to dive down to the bottom of the water and bring up some mud. Sure, said all the water animals, even though they had no idea what mud was. So said Charm, who wants to be first? Me, said Pelican, and he flew into the sky as high as he could and dropped like a knife into the water. He was gone a long time, but when he floated to the surface out of breath, he didn't have any mud. It was real dark down there, said Pelican, and cold. The next animal to try was a walrus. I don't mind the dark, said walrus, and my blubber will keep me warm. So down she went, and she was gone for longer than Pelican. But when she came to the surface coughing up water, she didn't have any mud either. I don't think the water has a bottom, said walrus. Sorry. Now, I'm sure you're beginning to wonder if there's a point to this story or if, <laughs> if I'm just going to work my way through all the water animals one by one. So one by one, all the water animals tried to, find, <laughs> tried to find the mud at the bottom of the ocean. And all of them failed until the only animal left was otter. Otter, however, wasn't particularly interested in finding mud. Is it fun to play with? Asked otter. Not really, said Charm. Is it good to eat? Asked otter. Not really, said Charm. Then why do you want it? Said otter. For the magic, said Charm. Oh, said Otter, I like magic. So Otter took a deep breath and dove into the water, and she didn't come up. Day after day, Charm and the animals waited for Otter to come to the surface. Finally, on the morning of the fourth day, just as the sun was rising, Otter's body floated up out of the depths. Oh, no, said all the animals. Otter is drowned trying to find the mud. And they hoisted Otter's body onto the back of the turtle. Now, when they hoisted Otter's body onto the back of the turtle, they noticed that her little paws were clenched shut. And when they opened her paws, they discovered something dark and gooey that wasn't water. Is this mud? asked the ducks. Yes, it is, said Charm. Otter has found the mud. Of course I found the mud, whispered Otter, who wasn't so much dead as she was tired and out of breath. <laughs> this magic better be worth it. Charms at the lump of mud on the back of the turtle, and she sang and she danced, and the animals sang and danced with her, and very slowly the lump of mud began to grow, and it grew and grew and grew into a world, part water, part mud. That was a good trick, said the water animals, but now there's not enough room for all of us in the water. Some of us are going to have to live on land. Not that anyone wanted to live on land. It was nothing but mud, mud as far as the eye could see, great jumbled lumps of mud. But before the animals could decide who was going to live where and what to do about the mud lump world, Charm had her baby. Or rather, she had her babies, twins. A boy and a girl, one light, one dark, one right-handed, one left-handed. Nice looking babies, said the cormorants. Hope they like mud. <laughs> and as it turned out, they did. The right-handed twins smoothed all the mud lumps until the land was absolutely flat. Wow, said all the animals, that's pretty clever. Now we can see in all directions. But before the animals could get used to all the nice flat land, the left-handed twins stomped around in the mud, piled it up, created deep valleys and tall mountains. Okay, said the animals, that could work. <laughs> and while the animals were admiring the new landscape, the twins really got busy. The right-handed twin dug nice straight trenches and filled them with water. These are rivers, he told the animals, and I've made the water flow in both directions so it'll be easy for you to come and go as you please. That's handy, said the animals. But as soon as her brother had finished, the left-handed twin made the rivers crooked and put rocks in the water and made it flow in only one direction. This is much more exciting, she told the animals. <laughs> Could you put in some waterfalls, said the animals. Everybody likes waterfalls. Sure, said the left-handed twin, and she did. 
The right-handed twin created forests with all the trees lined up so you could go into the woods and not get lost. The left-handed twin came along and moved the trees around so that some of the forest was dense and difficult and other parts were open and easy. How about some trees with nuts and fruit, said the animals, you know, in case we get hungry. That's a good idea, said the right-handed twin, and he did. The right-handed twin created roses. The left-handed twin put thorns on the stems. The right-handed twin created summer. The left-handed twin created winter. The right-handed twin created sunshine. The left-handed twin created shadows. Have we forgot anything, the twins asked the animals. What about human beings, asked the animals. Do you think we need human beings? Why not, said the twins, and quick as they could, the right-handed twin created women, the left-handed twin created men. (laughs) They don't look too bright, said the animals. We hope they won't be a problem. (laughs) Don't worry, said the twins, you guys are going to get along just fine. The animals and the humans and the twins and charm looked around at the world that they had created. Boy, they said, this is as good as it gets. This is one beautiful world. It's a neat story, isn't it? A little long, but different, maybe even a little exotic. Sort of like the manure-fired pots, or the hand-painted plates, or the woven palm hats, or the coconuts carved to look like monkey faces, or those nice colorful t-shirts that you buy on vacation. Souvenirs, you know, snapshots of a moment. And when the moment is passed, the hats are tossed into the closet, and the t-shirts are stuffed into drawers. The pots and plates and coconuts are left to gather dust on shelves. Eventually, everything is shipped off to a garage sale or slipped into the trash. As for stories such as the woman who fell from the sky, well, we listen to them, and then we forget them. For amidst the thunder of Christian monologues, they have neither purchase nor place. After all, within the North American paradigm, we have a perfectly serviceable creation story, and it goes like this. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. You you can't beat the King James Version of the Bible for the beauty of the language, but it's a story that captures our imagination. God creates night and day, the moon and the sun, all the creatures of the world, and finally towards the ends of his labor, he creates humans, man first and then woman, Adam and Eve. And then he places everything and everyone in a garden, a perfect world, no sickness, no hate, no death, no hunger. And there's only one rule. Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. One rule, don't break it. But that's exactly what happens, of course, Adam and Eve break the rule. Doesn't matter how it happens. If you like the orthodox version, you can blame Eve. She eats the apple and brings it back to Adam. Not that Adam says no. A less misogynistic reading would blame them both, would chalk up the debacle that followed as an unavoidable mistake, a wrong step, youthful enthusiasm, a misunderstanding, willfulness. But whatever you wish to call it, the rule has been broken, and that is the end of the garden. God seals it off and places an angel with a fiery sword at the entrance and tosses Adam and Eve into a howling wilderness to fend for themselves, a wilderness in which sickness and death, hate and hunger are their constant companions.